So you don't know my voice. I um, work on Graham's show. I've worked with them for eight-ish years now. And we're flipping the tables today. The profile interview is actually featuring Graham and not somebody else. So hopefully you guys enjoy uh, getting to know the interviewer as the interviewee. I wanted to start talking about Chris Fowler. Hmm. You guys have been friends for how long? I think I first met him when I was 15 ish so 36 now so yeah 20 plus years uh he was at the time also hosting a studio show for college basketball for espn and i think it was the final four or some round of march madness was in st louis and they were anchoring from union station and so i went down there and he was just walking to set and I randomly walk up to him, introduce myself, and told him I was hosting a local radio show or an internet radio show at the time and asked him if he would ever be willing to call in to yeah. the show. And to my surprise, he gave me his contact information and he started coming on a couple times a year just because he is a good guy and wanted to encourage an aspiring broadcaster to keep pursuing their passion. And so it started as that. And then I like hiking. He likes hiking and, you know, just became kind of friends. And he's been a, a huge source of advice and kind of inspiration to me over the years. What are some of those conversations like as you guys are out hiking in Colorado for hours and hours at a time? Just life. Uh, yeah, it, it only anything that's discussed work-related is more because I'm annoying him with questions. I think he'd much prefer never talking about work, but um, it's me who always has that on the mind. But uh, yeah, he has... Um, offered good kind of feedback and console at kind of different stages of life and career yeah. for me. And, uh, you know, probably just as much on the personal life as uh, professional. Is there an example you would like to offer up or would be open to offering up where you were at maybe a crossroads and he helped you lean one direction versus another? Um, deciding how to evolve the show, uh, figuring out kind of the next step for the show and streaming, uh, having a girlfriend of two and a half years who's moving in tomorrow, uh, advice on, on that. Uh, so yeah, he's just turned into a, a a friend and somebody I trust a lot. Very cool. So, Colorado. He does really cool stuff that isn't as uh, widely known, but he was, you know, just hiking in Nepal for a few weeks in the Himalayas. Uh, he left yesterday or the day before for uh, Africa to go gorilla tracking. Uh, you know, he um, is into so much stuff outside of sports broadcasting. And I think that's what um, I find really interesting about him. I could see you on both of those. Have you done Nepal? I have not. So that was okay. one I would have loved the opportunity to join him on, but I couldn't get away work-wise even if I wanted to. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned that you guys typically hike in Colorado. Uh -huh. um, and I know, you know, Typically around the summer, you spend a couple of there, months there with your family. What does that trip mean for you? One, I like being active. Uh, but I think I've probably put more value on it as I've gotten older and as you know, we're trying to build the show and the company because it's kind of a rare occasion where you can spend an extended amount of time somewhere and focus on the key work objectives 
that are important to you without being as caught up in the day-to-day -day because you just aren't present. And on one hand, it's not the best to not be a present boss. But on the other hand, I have found it helps me a lot to be able to sequester myself by myself uh, and just focus on key work stuff. So I think I look forward to it as much for the active element as I do just being able to lock down and kind of grind away. So it helps you kind of reset and see the big picture? Yeah. Have you thought about spending time in total darkness for days at a time? No, <laughs> like Aaron Rodgers and Jake Paul style? No. Uh, I, I, would, I would totally try something like that. Maybe this summer. Yeah, I don't think so. And uh, yeah, I think people like that interest me that are a little out of the box. You know, they're, we've been fortunate to profile a lot of big people for the show, but you know, there are a lot of big time sports stars who their whole lives they've only done one thing and just commit themselves to be the best at their craft. But every once in a while, there's one that's like, and it doesn't have to just be a sports star, but somebody of stature that's into, you know, a little bit of off the beaten path type stuff. And yeah. it's always a treat when we get to profile somebody like that. So quick, would you rather, would you rather spend two months in Colorado or two weeks in Iceland? Two months in Colorado. Why? Uh, because of the reset? I mean, more time in the mountains, the better. And that was a setup to bring up Iceland. So. <laughs> I figured that's where you, I almost <laughs> brought that up. So I hear that you'll be arrested upon reentry. What's that about? I don't know if that's true. It might be. Have you, have, did I send you the newspaper article? No, I haven't seen the article. Have, I did think. I tell you about it? No. Really? Okay, then that was intentional. I mean, what happened was I was speeding, you know, in the middle of nowhere in Iceland. In the middle of nowhere, nobody's around. You can't see a person for as far as you look out. And so I'm going over the speed limit. I think it was, I'm completely making this up, but I think it was going like 90 kilometers an hour in a 60 or 120 in a 90 or, um, I was, I was going too fast, uh, but nobody, nobody was around, and, but a, a policeman was, and he came over and, he, you know, stopped me. It was like a $3,000 ticket. U.S. dollar. U.S. dollar, because the fines for foreigners are so much greater than the fines for locals. And then he brings the credit card machine and is like, you can pay now if you want, give me your credit card. And I'm like, well, what happens if I don't pay now? And they're like, well, if you want to dispute it, uh, it goes through the court system and then we'll uh, you know, send you a fine, but we'll give you a 25% discount if you pay now, something like that. And uh, I'm like, why a discount? He's like, because it just takes a while for it to go through the court system. And I'm like, I've never gotten a $3,000 ticket before. And in fairness, like, I mean, I don't, I know I was speeding, but I don't know if the speed you're saying I was going is in fact accurate. So I'll let it go through the court system. And then all of a sudden I see this article that says I'll be arrested if I uh, come back into the country. And so I had one of my buddies who lives in Iceland look into it and they're like, no, it's just, it's still going through the court system. And so I don't know where it stands now, but uh, I would like to be able to go back to yeah. Iceland, and they haven't sent me anything to pay a fine yet, so no I'm assuming bill. at some point it's going to come. That's wild. Good luck. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the travel front still, um, I know that you adventured into Antarctica at the end of 2021. Um, so now you've been to every continent in the world. Congratulations. Um, where does the Antarctica trip rank among your adventures? Probably one of the two single best trips I ever went on. Uh, 
I, I did an Asia-Africa trip with my dad as uh, right at the tail end of college. He told me all when I was growing up, like, you know, before you enter the workforce, if I can afford it, um, at, at some point we're going to do this trip, which was like his dream. And so I got to tag along for that. And it was like the coolest thing ever, you know, just father, son. Yeah. Just trip. the two of you. And yeah. I've never so, heard you talk about this. Yeah. It was, it was really, really neat. Um, and I'll remember that forever and hope to someday if I have kids to be able to do that as well. Um, but then the Antarctica thing, um, uh, you know, which I took my girlfriend on, I mean, you get there and it's like you're on another planet. Uh, you land a plane on the ice and then, you know, you're just for nine days hiking around on glaciers and one-on-one -on -one intimate experiences with penguins. And we're in the middle of nowhere on some glacier and we run into a group of penguins that probably had never even seen people before. And we're in arm's reach. We could have touched them if we wanted. We did not because, you know, you aren't supposed to. But then, yeah, we just hiked with them for like an hour and a half. It was a blast. And that must have been paradise for you because I talked to your sister, Lisa, uh, in prep for this interview, and she was gushing about your love for animals. She said that's one thing that people probably don't know about Graham is how much of an animal advocate and lover he is. And she specifically brought up your trip to Jordan that you took oh. her on for her 30th birthday. Do you know where I'm going with this? No, but I, uh, I surprised her for her 30th birthday. We were in Monaco for work. And uh, easy trip for me, less easy trip for her. But so for in five days we did Egypt, Israel, and Jordan. And so just hit the highlights over uh, five days. And uh, you're probably gonna bring up the stray cats. Yeah, the Bengal cat in particular. That she said there was one Bengal cat Every night after dinner, you would find this cat and play with it for hours. And you are also allergic to cats, but you had like formed a bond with this cat and were trying to figure out ways to have it come back with you to St. Louis. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I really put any effort into figuring out how to bring it back because I'm very allergic to cats. But yeah, it, it was crazy. There were all these, I mean, tons of feral cats there. Um, unlike any place I'd ever been. One other interesting side note when we were in Jordan, they also have tons of stray dogs. And uh, we were driving back from Petra, which is Indiana Jones fame. Uh, we were hiking around there for a day and uh, I see all these stray dogs on the side of the road. And so I have some extra food. So I have the uh, driver stop and we get out and uh, I, uh, you know, open the food up to give the dog some, and all of a sudden I see probably four dozen dogs just running at me from all ends, oh full God. speed. And so I like dropped the food and ran as fast as I could back to the car. But um, yeah, it went from like thinking this was going to be a fun moment to right. like fearing you're going to get really, really hurt. Did it turn? Did the dogs get aggressive with each other over the food? Yes. Yeah. So it was uh, not the best yeah. decision. Yeah. She brought up that trip to Petra, which apparently was a three hour drive. And she said in that trip and then in a lot of your adventures with your sister, like you always just end up interviewing everyone. I As, do? Yeah. She's like, he just interviews everyone everywhere we go. Anyone he meets, like they become the next interviewee on what, Graham's show. What did she say? She said that you were asking him like the entire three hour trip to Petra. You just like asked him questions, 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 and like brought up a lot of like, uh, what is the culture like? What is it like to live in a culture where like men can have multiple wives? Oh, I thought this was where you were <laughs> What is it like if a woman also wants to have multiple partners and just like, I mean, absorbing information, but uh, sitting in the interview chair? Yeah. I, uh, I remember when we were, uh, I was in North Africa, actually, and on a solo hike with a guide, and I was asking him similar questions about uh, having 
you know, ha multiple wives. And I'm like, can women have multiple husbands? And he's like, no, absolutely not. I'm like, why not? And he goes, because if they do, we kill them. And I'm like, time to end this hike. Right. You know, because he's, he's dead not serious. joking. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the things that I most enjoy about this show is when there are opportunities to experience different cultures and learn about different places. And, you know, Carlos went on his first international trip with us not too long ago, just behind the, the camera right there, to Italy to film with Starbucks Howard Schultz for a company where he was once a barista. And so, I mean, we've been to New Zealand and Azerbaijan and the Congo and Alaska. And so it's like one of my favorite things about having the opportunity to do this. Last thing from your sister. She said you do not let the cleaning staff clean the room during your stay there. Ever. Anywhere. No. I, there's never... So you're like Howie Mandel? The, no. It's only because I don't trust anybody. <laughs> and so the, actually the only time I will allow it is sometimes when I'm on personal vacation, but there has never been a work trip where I've ever allowed it. Um, and if they don't have the thing that you can put on the door saying privacy, please, I'll call the front desk and ask somebody to bring it up. And if they don't have one, I'll make sure the front desk doesn't let anybody clean. And if somebody does clean, I throw a fit at the front desk. Uh, so let's talk about your childhood. Get a sense of what you were like as a kid. You had your internet-based radio show when you were in eighth grade, before the word podcast was even a word, right? Right. So what was it like, the juxtaposition of like having Ernie Banks call into your radio show on a random Tuesday night and then Wednesday morning stepping in to class for a geometry quiz? Like, to help it, like set the scene. Uh, it was just kind of, my hobby or you know people had sports after school which i guess we were required to do in high school but my kind of sport was this internet radio show uh and i remember going back to you know middle school i just always had visions of having the opportunity to create a company and uh, having the opportunity to like create a team of In middle people school? Work, working for stuff. Yeah, I used to always, uh, I would uh, often when we had like library or uh, you know, empty periods, step out and make calls to try and book people for and then internet radio show and all that sort of stuff. Or, or then later on in high school, call local companies that I was trying to get to advertise on the show. So it's very much, I'm very much doing now what I was doing then. Did your friends think, did they, were they impressed by it or did they think it was weird? Uh, I don't think either. Um, I remember one time I went to uh, Cardinals winter warm-up uh, because born and raised in St. Louis, still live here, and uh, you're, you're smiling. Do you, <laughs> uh, I was thinking about a Woody Williams story. Oh, Woody? yeah. Did somebody tell you that? Or? You did, a long oh, time I ago. I did? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so Cardinals winter warm-up where I'm just waiting for players to hand them letters to appear on my internet radio show. And uh, we're, you know, waiting for players and have nothing better to do. So we're at the convenience store at the hotel uh, looking, trying to <laughs> sneak a look at a Playboy. <laughs> and uh, in walks Woody Williams and uh, then ended up giving them the letter. and. He came on the radio show, and he actually texted me, strangely enough, the other day, saying what? he just saw the show on, like, Fox Sports Houston or wherever he's uh, living now. So That's funny that you guys still keep up. Um, 
All right, so I'm curious if you have advice today to your high school self. Something you would embrace more fully or do differently? No, because the advice I'd have today to my high school self would be probably the advice I have now to myself that I still don't follow, which is um, take a breather. Everything will be okay. Um, I had one other random, we're bouncing here for a second, but uh, do you still have the taser that you secretly bought when you were in high school? No, my dad confiscated it because I uh, said to uh, cleaning people at my parents' house, uh, they asked if it hurt, and I said, no, it just feels like, oh, you know, no. like a little pinch. And uh, there's a female cleaning person and then like a, 270 pounds six foot five male cleaning person and she's like well i'll do it to him and so he's like yeah i don't care so she does it to him and he just drops oh my gosh and like my parents had a glass shower he like falls into the glass shower it did not break but i thought it might and i take off running for my life you oh know? my gosh and uh you're in high school yeah it's something like that yeah and so my dad ended up confiscating that and rightfully so i'm lucky i didn't get my ass kicked because lisa says you used to chase her around the, as soon as your parents would leave the house and it was just the two of you she said you would chase her around with this taser no, never actually got that. her I, right. I would have never actually tased her but i don't remember that at all okay not uh, saying it didn't happen i just don't right. remember. Yeah. all right so now you're 19 and the to interview has happened his tenure as a professional athlete is now in question you're going on The Tonight Show, you're with Conan O'Brien, you've got a feature from then when Vince, Bill Simmons was... was, was um, ESPN. Oh, yeah, yeah. Steve Russian was with Sports Illustrated, but Bill Simmons was like the, arguably the biggest, him and Rick Riley were the two biggest sports columnists at, at the yeah. time, and Bill Simmons had page two and the sports guy and obviously then did a podcast and so on. But I just imagine that like, it's just chaos. Like, I mean, you're stepping into like uncharted territory in terms of like, all of a sudden you're in the national spotlight. But what was that like? What was your recollection now looking back? Uh, of what period? Sure, uh, after the TO interview. Oh, like um, after you headline Sports Center, and now everyone seemingly knows your name. It was, very weird because for a, a ton of different reasons. But first, T.O. was arguably the biggest player in the NFL at the time. And I had developed a relationship with him over the years because he just was being nice to a high school kid who was trying to start their career out of broadcasting and would call into my radio show. I mean, one time he called into my radio show the day before he played in the Super Bowl like crazy yeah everybody wants that interview crazy um, and then he does this interview with me for ESPN and as a result of the comments he made in the interview he was suspended by the Eagles for the rest of the season but I felt like ESPN just aired the most controversial parts which I get there's limited time, you can only hear the new, most newsworthy content, but I felt like there was so much more of this interview that could have aired that if it had context, it would have been perceived differently. And I put him in that situation for that to happen. Um, I didn't have a show where you could do long form interviews. And so I felt like I screwed over this guy who viewed me as, you know, his little buddy and who I knew was just doing it to be nice to me. So there was that. Then. Well, but you submitted like a 60 minute interview to, to ESPN, right? You handed over like the full right, piece. Right. Um, so it was unintentional. Sure. But it was still. He was trusting me. Right. So it's still, at the end of the day, my fault. Like, genuinely, I, I believe that. 
So there, there was that. They literally opened the show with, like literally the first moments when the anchors are on screen in an interview with ESPN.com contributor Graham Bensinger. And it was like, holy shit. you know, I'm a college freshman and what is going on? And then the next day he gives a press conference to the gathered media apologizing for his interview with Graham Bensinger. And then two days later, I get invited to a football game with O.J. Simpson, uh, where I'm sitting in a box with like a, a date, O.J., and uh, some other people. I, while I'm in sitting in the box, I get an email, and it's from Nick Lachey. And Nick, at the time, it's Nick Lachey and Jessica Simpson. They are the biggest thing on the planet with newlyweds congratulating me on the interview. And I was then going from there to fly to L.A. to be on The Tonight Show. It was just uh, out of the, you know, like very, very strange experience for somebody who had kind of no exposure to that world before. So you, you mentioned you were at Syracuse at the time, you were a freshman. Did you feel any sort of jealousy among your classmates for the newfound fame? No, not at all. I didn't, uh, I didn't really think anybody even had any idea who I was or even had, amidst all of this yeah had really didn't know until i had a journalism class and they would do these weekly quizzes on current events because you were required to i'm sure i've told you this story before you were required to read the new york times and usa today every day and then they'd quiz you once a week and there'd be like five questions on current events and then they'd always have a bonus question at the end. And so I, I remember, you know, you take this written test and then you pass it forward and there are like probably 200 people in the class. And uh, I remember getting to the bonus question when I was taking the quiz and it said, which one of your classmates is responsible for getting the biggest player in the NFL suspended for the rest of the season. I just, um, like my hands are sweating now thinking about that. Mm. It's like, you know, that wasn't like a cool moment for me. That was yeah. like so like debilitating and embarrassing. And uh, like, I read that and like anything I can do to just get out of here right now, because they then once it's over, they review the questions together. And mm. so at the front of the class, and so going down one by one, and then when it comes time to the bonus question, the entire like 200 person class just turns and staring at me. <laughs> and like, I had no idea up until that moment that like anybody had yeah. any idea. Yeah. So. Um, did, it, did it help you land a date? Land any dates? Uh, not, I mean, I could count the number of times freshman year I went out in Syracuse on one hand. But you're in a you're in a pool of aspiring journalists, and like here you are, but moving, I, moving these mountains. Well, yeah, I mean, that's a, I wouldn't go okay, that far. But sure. I uh, I just was traveling for work, and you know you're trying to have like a what's turning into almost a full time job in addition right. to being a full time student. There was just no time for anything. Uh, first semester sophomore year, I became a part time student. Yeah, And then there was time to go out a little more. And then I, I left after first semester, sophomore year, but stayed in Syracuse for another semester. So At like the advice sophomore. of your counselor. Oh, yeah, right. Um, and so there was the opportunity to go out a little more then. But uh, I had kind of a non-existent college experience relative to most people I know that went to college. Right, right. All right, so staying with Syracuse for just a transition, um, about a year ago, you sat down with your childhood idol, Bob Costas, who wrote your letter of recommendation to help get you into Syracuse, mm -hmm. which is phenomenal. Um, I think you told our BTS guy, Mario, in advance of Costas, that you were more nervous before that interview 
than with any other previous interview for the show. 100%, yeah. Um, so what tips or tricks do you use to try and calm these nerves? Uh, there was nothing. You yeah. got nothing? No. You just... Uh, it depends the situation. Sometimes the less you think about it, the better you are. And other times, if I think about it constantly, that then eases the discomfort when I'm actually in the scenario. The most nervous I've ever been for anything was when I, there are two times, uh, one when I did Jay Leno, and two uh, when I asked Kobe about the rape charges. If you had a heart rate monitor on your wrist, <laughs> I that would have been phenomenal. And there are two very specific moments I remember with each of those. Uh, with Kobe, it was right before, it started like a couple questions before I knew the question was going to be coming. Yeah. Where the heart is beating like so aggressively that I start feeling it in my ears. Uh, and then with the Tonight Show, it's just standing behind the curtains, getting ready to go out where, you know, there's somebody that's giving you the countdown. Yeah. And then you see the lights come up from behind the curtain and then, you know, Leno starts talking and then, then you're up and, uh, you know, especially not having had any experience with that sort of thing before, but understanding the impact that it could have on what you hope to be your future career. Um, it's yeah. like a decision to wear pants or shorts on the David Letterman show. Yeah. Do you get it? No. That's uh, Ray Romano. During his sit down with you, he talked about like this big decision to wear pants or shorts. So I decided not to cut, I go, you know what, I'm not gonna cut my pants. And again, I'm making more of this. And I went out and I had, you know, I'm hard on myself, but I had one of the best TV spots I've, I've ever done. And I think, had I cut my pants, I'm delivering your futon. I also don't remember most things that people have told me in interviews. I, I remember very, very little. And almost, the only things I really remember are the things that appear in our show highlight reel. Mm. Which is not very much. Right. <laughs> Obviously, you've sat down with like a ton of impressive people, a lot of entrepreneurs, leaders, self-starters, people who are like obsessed with continu continually improving themselves. Have you been offered a bite of wisdom that like resonated with you, stuck with you, that you try and lean into from just your, the amount of exposure and access that you get to these people? No. That's a damn shame. But, well, the question was, have you been offered a bite of wisdom that's stuck with you? I haven't been offered anything that's stuck with me, but I think from preparing and sitting with mm. a, enough people who have achieved, achieved unbelievable amounts of success, what is crystal clear is their work ethic. I mean, there are like no shortcuts that it's just none of these people got to where they were because, you know, they were on some get rich quick or, you know, just got lucky. Yeah. Now, you have to be lucky to have that amount of success, but hard work creates the opportunity to get lucky more often. And so I feel like, you know, I only went to college for a year and a half, but have basically had the opportunity to have ongoing lessons by just sitting with uber successful people. And it is so motivating and in, in inspiring and you know whenever you get down uh it's very easy to 
remember somebody else's story and then you can kind of snap out of it because, you know, everybody we featured has done so much more and gone through so much more significant circumstances or hurdles to get to where they are. A lot of people ask you, like in just casual conversation, why do you have your office in St. Louis? So obviously, like we're a production house at our core. We're not in New York or L.A. So what is it for you? I think St. Louis or smaller cities are very underrated overall. Uh, I mean, admittedly, I was born and raised in St. Louis. Friends and family are here, so that was the obvious and immediate draw. But I just don't think big city living has as many benefits as others obviously do. Tons of people, tons of traffic, unreasonable costs of living. And so I feel very lucky that with this show, we have the opportunity to be in big cities often for work, as you hear the ice maker in the background. But then you can come back to a place where you can kind of get anywhere in 20 minutes and yeah. not much traffic, reasonable cost of living. And I kind of feel like we have the best of both worlds. So I see zero motivation to ever relocate. And as sea levels rise, we got a leg up on being in the middle of, of America. Sure. Now, as tornadoes worsen, I don't know that that helps us much. <laughs> That's true. So, I mean, there are pros and cons of everywhere, but yeah, I think uh, I like St. Louis. Have you spoken to your buddy Larry about climate control recently? <laughs> no. Uh, so Dan, uh, his real name, but Larry the Cable Guy, who we profiled for an episode a while back, is a climate change denier. And we've since become friends. And so I just like getting under his skin as I like annoying everybody. And yeah. so I will DM him stories about climate change and then just await these essay long responses. <laughs> to so, poke the bear. Yeah. And so he's a good guy, though. And, you know, it's fun having friendships with people with different points of view. So it's how it should be. I mean, even if I think some of his views are insane, that's okay. Yeah. Because he's a good guy and he means well. And, you know, there's plenty of other things that you can be friends over. And, I mean, you've developed some uh, close relationships with other past guests, too. And didn't you help connect... What was it, like Kelly Slater and Tom Hanks or something like that? Oh, yeah. Or, yeah. What was that story? Oh, I, no, he I, I just uh, wanted to, con to connect with Tom, and we uh, featured him for each of them for an episode before, and so I made that connection. And then, um, unbeknownst to me, years later, when we were trying to book Valentino Rossi for an episode... It just so happened that Kelly was friends with Valentino. And so Kelly then was kindly willing to put in a good word, which was singularly the reason the Valentino Rossi taping happened in Italy. Which turned into a fantastic interview for us. Oh, yeah, and Valentino was awesome. <laughs> Mamma mia. Yeah. And somebody who did not do long form interviews really much at all. So, and that's a complete credit to Kelly. You're pretty good at disarming people when you first sit down with them by talking about your hairline. I feel Is like I've stopped doing that a little bit yeah. because you guys all make fun of me for it. I haven't been on a shoot in a while. Yeah. So do you have a new go-to? Mm, no. And then I did this PRP thing, it's called, where they take your blood out and they like spin it in something and then re-inject it in 
oh. your forehead where I'm balding here, and it's working a, a little bit. And it hasn't affected long. your vocal cords. It hasn't no. Well, that was the hair transplant that affected Joe Buck's uh, okay. vocal cords. But um, no, PRP is just. Uh, they give you like 30 shots in your affected area. It's horribly painful. Um, how do you think that you've changed over the last year? I don't know. Do you think um, you're the same person you were last year? Um, <laughs> probably rougher around the edges over the past year than, than I, I was. Um, I, I would say, I mean, this has been a very, very difficult year because we're working on really trying to grow the show. And so I feel like every seven-ish years you have to blow up to try and accelerate growth and also just not die um, because if you aren't growing, you're dying. Um, and so the unintended consequences of trying to create positive change are long work hours, stress, staff turnover, uh, et cetera. And so it's not like unexpected going into it, but it is, I think, unfortunately, a necessity if the desire is to keep building and, and growing. And you got emotional about a month ago or so. <laughs> Um, during a team meeting talking about your appreciation, showing your appreciation for the team's hard work recently. Mm -hmm. I just uh, appreciate, not trying to get emotional. Oh my God. <laughs> but yeah, I just uh, appreciate everybody for their contributions, all of us. What was like behind those, they were tears, they were literal, literal tears. Yeah, I don't know, that was very humiliating. Was um, it? Why? I think that I actually, I mean, from my perspective, I thought I appreciated it. Uh, I mean, it's been a really hard uh, year. So, yeah, I just, you know, the only reason any of what we've been pursuing, uh, which we can't get into on here, um, has been possible is because of everybody's effort. And... Um, you know, I don't think that always gets acknowledged in the way it should by me, but what we were meeting about was the culmination of everybody's collective effort. And yeah, I knew I was going to get emotional. It was so bad. Like I was dreading, I did not want to have that meeting when you suggested it solely for that purpose. And I would like, was trying to get around doing it and I knew you weren't going to allow that to happen. And so then like the day before it was all I could think about. I'm like, I'm going to end up getting emotional in this thing. And th I'm like, I know I have to say something at the start of it. Um, but then I'm like, well, maybe I can get around saying something. And then I'm <laughs> like, no, I, I'm not going to be able to get around saying something okay, well, maybe if I just don't stand up and say something and I just sit in the corner where nobody can see me, I can control myself a little better. And I think that none of it worked. And it was just a pathetic display of... I mean, nothing wrong with a heart, heartfelt moment, yeah. in my opinion. And, like, it, I, it, it, like, elevated, like, the genuine gesture, I really think. Um, and Hillary was there. She was. And your mom was there. They were. It was a, a special little community. So how did you and Hillary meet? On a dating app. Uh, so what makes that relationship work? You guys have been together for how long? Two and a half years. Okay. She, a little more than two and a half years, and she moves in tomorrow. What makes it work? She's just um, smart, nice, pretty, and just has a a level of tolerance that defies objectivity, so. Who said I love you first? She did. Did you reciprocate in the moment? No, I took a very, very long time. What is, how, what is a long time? From when she said it to when I said it? I, a year. A year, okay. I mean like a year in between. 
Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, could have even been more. I'm not sure. Like uh, a horrible gap. Um, but my whole thing was, you know, it's like you don't want to say that to too many people yeah. in life, right? And so you want to not be saying it because, oh, only because your partner's saying it, but because you actually mean it. And so... Your hesitancy to say it gives it value. I, I think, but I, I could imagine her also losing patience with that one because... Well, you didn't say it just to say it. Yeah, right. Um, I reached out to her for a couple questions, too. Oh, God. So one of her questions... What's something, either professionally or in your personal life, that you're striving to do better? I mean, more tolerance and patience. Okay. And understanding. That's sweet of you. In both my professional and personal life. Yeah. And we have video submitted questions too. Hello, Graham. I'm going to ask you a few questions. I'm sure right now you are miserable with everyone turning the tables on you and asking questions about you, but it's about time that someone asks you questions about your life. So here we go. Don't be too afraid. So Graham, we are moving in together this weekend and you are oh, very God. allergic to my cats, <laughs> but you very kindly allowed me to create a cat room in the house. That way I am still able to bring my cats. Very kind of you. So besides your cat allergy, um, how else are you feeling about me moving in with you? How else are you feeling? Terrified. Yeah? Yeah. Because it came up in conversation the other day that Dan thinks, Dan Fredman thinks that the move in is a more significant relationship hurdle than an, like an engagement. Oh, 100%. Yeah, because when you move in with somebody, you don't yet know how you are living together. Right. So, and you're likely only moving in together. I mean, we're only moving in together out of desire to take the next step in the relationship. And so then if it works out, you likely take another step. But if you can't tolerate living with one another, then you know, it's, it's over, right? So yeah. I think there's more, if you get engaged after living together successfully, there's less that, less uncertainty. Right. So I think there's more uncertainty going into living together. And it's not out of concern for her. I, I mean, it's more like, I think I'm just a difficult person to live with. Or just a difficult person in general. How long do you think until you know whether it's going to be a fit or not? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Hopefully soon. I hope so too. Yeah. Here's our second. Great. How has our relationship impacted your life? Uh, she has made me realize how bad of a person I am because she's such a great person. It's a, it's a compliment. Yeah, I guess. Why do you use humor to redirect and avoid sharing your feelings and being vulnerable? <laughs> God, you guys are horrible. Hopefully you answer these questions honestly, and I hope you had fun with this experience. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting punked. Uh, I don't even recognize that I do that. She points it out to me all the time. Do you think I do that? Yeah. Really? Yeah. You have a knack for making people feel comfortable, helping people to, you kind of like have a disarming, approach of like have a slice of humble pie now like this person drops their guard so we see what that looks like professionally what does that look like personally i i think it comes off much more aggressive in my personal life because we'll be out on a date with a another couple and i'll you know start grilling the 
But just asking what I want to ask without regard for social norm. Like the other day, I uh, flew somewhere for a meeting with a marketing exec, and it's just the two of us at lunch, and you know, I'm telling him about moving in with the girlfriend to tomorrow, and uh, we start talking about marriage. I'm like, so tell me something. Uh, you be, and he told me how long he'd been married for, 20-something years. I'm like, you married still because you want to be married truly or out of convenience? And he's like, he's like out of, probably out of convenience. <laughs> and like, Dang. you know, I've gotten together with him a couple times before, yeah. but not like, I don't know. I just think that like conversation is more interesting if you ask people about real shit as opposed to like surface level social norm stuff. So I actually think I'm probably more aggressive about it in personal life than professionally because professionally I'm more conscious and I, I, I care more about what the other person thinks. Whereas like personal life, it's just, you know, you do, ask what you want to ask. Do your family and friends call you out? Like when you flex your interview skills on them? Like, no, because no. I don't think I'm actually doing it. I just it's, like, it's just who you are. Yeah. But you've made a career out of a personality trait. What's the personality trait? Inquisitive, curious, unashamed in asking tough questions. See, I feel like I'm becoming more of a pushover as I get older. I'm giving more people a pass on stuff I wouldn't when I was younger because I'm more conscious as I age about social norms and what is and isn't or the pros acceptable. and acceptable pros and cons of pissing people off. Yeah, maybe. So let's keep firing. We're we're in the home stretch of this culture. Like yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's just dive in. So we're slowly growing it in depth. You're at the helm. Um, what do you look for in new hires? Temperament. Continue. Uh, so you need somebody who has the skills to do the job. You need somebody with strong work ethic. I would take somebody less skilled who had strong work ethic and I would take somebody less skilled who has the right temperament, meaning like good attitude. Right, and like, like a calm demeanor? Or like or just a somebody who, like Carlos, like uh, I'm speaking from an attitude perspective, like, you know, we've been on some, and I'm sure you've heard about this JT, some <laughs> shoots like that are, um, I mean, I generally always have a good time, but the crew doesn't always, uh, that are just hard. And, you know, there are plenty of skilled people out there. But there are a lot of people that when the going gets tough, they get going, you know? Or like when the going gets tough, they just turn into <laughs> And you could have a amazing team of people, but if there's one person that turns sour, it ruins it for everybody else. And so I think as I am, and I know I'm difficult, um, but I, I think as I'm getting older with like hirings, uh, it's just super important to find people that have good temperaments in addition to being game to work hard. Is that tough to discern from one, two, or three interviews? Oh, horribly tough. And I think that's why I have, as often as I can, revert to people that come through recommendations of people I trust or people I know. Because, like, temperament is something, same with work ethic that you can't get from a resume. 
What does a healthy, thriving office culture look like? I mean, people need to be happy. Uh, people need to feel taken care of. And I feel like we're making strides in that direction, but I feel like there's plenty of room for improvement. Uh, just like with the show, like the show's of work in progress. Um, I mean, you've been here longer than anybody. Um, left once, came back. Uh, so you have, you can speak to this topic specifically. How, how has stuff changed from when you first started? Well, the team is completely different. Um, but, so I would say it boils down to the leader at the top, and I think that you are a lot more hands-off and more trusting in the people you hire to do the jobs you hire them to do, uh, which, is, uh, which goes a long way. So I think it starts at the top. So you have, sometimes you send people things in an effort to convey a message. One time you sent a woman a whole lot of toilet paper on her front porch step. Why did you do that? Uh, <laughs> I was trying to hire the person and I wanted them to sh or get off the pot. Did it work? Yeah. How many rolls of toilet paper do you think you sent? I have no idea. Do you know? I remember, because I was there, I remember you just saying it has to be a ridiculous amount or else it won't make sense. I remember um, it. I do remember that because we worked together for only a couple of years, but at the end of the couple of years, she still had toilet paper <laughs> she, left. She yeah. was set. Right. <laughs> um, and then also you went and um, had one of your emails that you sent blown up into a large proportion on poster board and then com accompanied that with a pair of reading glasses and sent that out to Serena Williams' agent. Yes. Why do such a thing? Because... I was unsure that she was getting or able to read my emails because she wasn't responding to me. Was there an age reference in there? Uh, there was. There was. Yeah. Have and then she, uh, she called me. Uh, so I sent the poster board, the email blown up, and she did not respond. And I overnighted this, which to overnight like a four foot by four foot piece of poster board is like hundreds of dollars. And so I'm like, that sucks. And so a couple of days later, I overnighted her a magnifying glass with a note saying, perhaps you had difficulty reading that. I thought this might help. And she then called me and you know, I see who it is calling. I answer the phone. She's like, you mother. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's like, actually, like I was using the magnifying glass to look at something today because my eyes aren't as good. So you know, it's like nobody needs our show, right? Like an A-list talent we're trying to book or a big distribution partner or a sponsor. Nobody needs us. So it becomes a, a relational sales process. And so, you know, you just try and have a little fun with it and get creative. And it's like, I don't know, I get some joy out of that too. Um, in closing, Graham. When it's all said and done, either you're retired or you're dead. Maybe you were hiking up a mountain and you were a little too ambitious or something. That's um, nice. Foreshadowing? How, how do you want to be remembered? What the f kind of questions are these? This is my last question, basically. First, it probably won't be remembered. <laughs> but uh, Everyone will be remembered by someone. I don't know how I will or won't be remembered. I think I, my professional goal is just to try and make the most of my ability. Uh, I shouldn't say perfect. My personal goal is to just try to make the most of my ability, whatever that is. And then you want to be a nice guy and try to create a positive place for people to work and to have careers and to foster an environment where people can grow and 
similarly, uh, you know, achieve their professional goals. Um, and then it'd be neat to be able to have a wife and kids and family and uh, raise contributing members of society and, you know, be a good partner or brother or something. I'd never heard you talk about kids before, I don't think. Is that no. a, like a, have you had some heartfelt conversations with Hillary? Oh, she wants to have kids. Yeah. I mean, I've always had interest in having kids. Uh, but, you know, I think the worst thing for me would be having kids with the wrong person. Or, you know, somebody who ha having kids with me that doesn't like me for me, right? Like your, I feel like your relationship has to be strong yeah. if you're going to do that. And who you marry is arguably the single most important decision you can make in, in life. And so all that stuff has to be, you know, secure before making that next step, in my mind. Um, so, you know, I think I'm very slow moving, but uh, definitely have interest in doing it. Is there anything else you'd like to add to this interview? You. You know everything. There's nothing else I can add to this interview. You know everything. Anything I didn't ask that we should have covered? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs>